Well, welcome to Upton Baptist Church this morning. Uh, welcome in particular to, well, to everyone, but in particular uh, to Ben Slatter, who's joining us from Ebenezer Baptist Church in Mould. Uh, also to any new visitors, anybody who's here for their first time or first few times, and as well for those joining online as well. Uh, we got some notices that we're going to cover at the start. They are, firstly, church lunch is happening after the service. You do not have to have brought anything to stay for church lunch. There's plenty of food, so please stay and join us for church lunch after the service. Uh, secondly, communion. So that's happening this afternoon. Uh, it'll be happening at five o'clock, but you can arrive from half four. There'll be teas and coffees beforehand, and then communion at five. This Wednesday, we have our home groups. So they'll be meeting in different houses. Now, if anybody would like to come, but is unsure what house in Chester they should turn up at, because that's quite an important thing, please speak to Ray or Ian, who are both at the back. And if you ask around, people will know who Ray and Ian are. So speak, speak to them. They'll be able to direct you to a home group. Next Sunday, uh, Vinnie Commons from Southport is going to be coming to speak to us in the morning. Uh, he is going to be speaking at the morning, but also in the evening, because in the evening, it's our food get the name of it right, Food for Thought. So it's an evangelistic event. It'll be happening at 6 p.m. And it'll be a meal with a message. And the message will be on stability in an unstable world. So please invite your friends, your family, your neighbors, any school or colleague friends, work colleagues, people off the street, anyone is welcome. So feel free to invite them along for 6 o'clock on stability in an unstable world. Lillian Thompson also is asked to pass on uh, uh, thanks for all the kindnesses she received around her birthday. And as well as that, for any children in the room, there's quite a few notes, isn't there? Any children in the room, uh, there are two bits of literature or little booklets that you might receive. So one of them is a GBM, Grace Baptist Mission, Let's Go magazine. You'll get that in Sunday school. But if any of you are interested in Secret Smuggler, uh, there's a few copies on the back table. That's a little children's booklet about the persecuted church. And the rest of the notices are all in the notice sheet. So you can look through that for the rest of the notices as well. We're going to start by singing together our first hymn. It's Before the Throne of God Above. And if you can stand if you're able uh, to join us with singing Before the Throne of God Above. Well, 
for our second hymn. Father, I thank you for the good news that we have that unites us together as Christians, good news of hope through Jesus, through knowing that because uh, you look upon him, we are pardoned, we are forgiven, we are free. And we thank you for that. We thank you for the grace and the mercy that's been shown to us through him. I pray, Father, for each of us that we would leave with a bigger image in our minds of Jesus, of all his love for, for us, all his mercy for us than when we first entered this room today. Father, I pray that you would bless the Bible being read, Father, the hymns that we sing when we think through them, Father, the conversations that will happen after the service and the preaching as well, Father, that you'd bless that for all of us, Father. Strengthen us, build us up, help us to fix our mind more and more on Christ. Help us put aside all the worries and the different thoughts of the week, Father, to focus in on the grace and the mercy that we have through Jesus. Thank you for this in your name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing now our second hymn, On the Cross, On the Cross. like to take a seat. Uh, we're going to do our Bible reading uh, for the day, after which I'll hand, o- hand over to Ben, uh, who will take us from there. So the Bible reading is Isaiah, starting at chapter 52, verse 13. So Isaiah 52, verse 13, and we're going through to, uh, yeah, the complete of 53, Isaiah 53. Uh, it's page 613, if you've got one of the church Bibles at the back. So Isaiah 52, verse 13. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, 
and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see, and that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before them like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut, out, he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his day. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. I'm going to hand over to Ben, uh, who'll take us from here. Thanks very much. It's really good to be with you all. We're going to start with the children's talk. So I've been told if any children want to come to the front, come and sit at the front, and I'll, I'll speak to you for a few moments. It's so good to see you in church today. That's it, come and, come and have a seat, ready to listen. Grab a seat on the floor if there's not enough room on the chairs. Okay, I've got two things here. Anyone put their hand up and tell me, what are these? What am I holding? What are these? Jigsaw puzzles, yeah. Are you good at jigsaw puzzles? You're good at them? Excellent, I like your confidence. Um, yeah, so for a jigsaw puzzle, you get the picture, don't you, on the lid and it tells you what's on the inside. And I was thinking, it's a bit like you guys, you come to church and your leaders and your teachers, they give you the big picture of God, don't they? They tell you all about God and who he is and how brilliant he is. But maybe when you come to read the Bible for yourselves, it feels a bit like that. All these little bits, a bit tricky, a bit difficult to piece together. So you might open up your Bible and you might read a bit of Genesis one day, first book of the Bible. And then another day you might be reading a bit of Jonah, book of Jonah. And then you might be reading the book of Acts in the New Testament. Or you might be listening to learning about God the Father. And then you might be learning about Jesus, who is God. And then you might be learning about the Holy Spirit. And you might think, how does it all fit together? How does it piece together? And all I want to say to you today is just to encourage you to keep working at the Bible and putting it all together. Do any of you guys have any strategies for solving jigsaw puzzles? Where do you start when you're doing a jigsaw puzzle? What kind of pieces do you do first when you're doing a jigsaw puzzle? Yeah? The edges, yeah. And what edge parts might you start with first of all? Yeah? The corners. Brilliant. Yeah, you might start with the corners. And it's the same with the Bible. What you really want to get into your head, first of all, in the Bible is the cornerstones, the foundations. Who is Jesus? 
Why did he die for us? Okay. How can I be saved? Those kind of things. And then you might find pictures of animals or people's faces, and you can start to put those together. And as you come to church, and as you talk with your parents, and as you read the Bible, you start to piece it all together. Who is God? You start working out who is God. Who are the, who are the church? Why do we come here on a Sunday? And you start to piece the Bible all together. And you know, the best way to do a jigsaw puzzle at Christmas or in your home is to do it with other people, isn't it? Who might you do a jigsaw puzzle with? Who might help you do a jigsaw puzzle? Who could help you? Yeah? Brilliant. Your brother, your parents, your friends, your family, yeah? Any people you want to play with. And it's a, that's the reason why we come to church all together here, is to piece the Bible together, okay? And the reason that we're piecing the Bible together is because we want to get a true and a big picture of God, because we really want to know God. That is the meaning of life. That's the most important thing in the whole of your lives is to truly know God and have a friendship with him. And so we come together to learn God's word together and to meet God in the Bible. And the most important thing of all is to ask God to help us. When you read the Bible at home, it's really good to start by praying and saying, God, help me understand this. I really, really want to know you. Would you help me? And his Holy Spirit will help you in your heart as you're reading the Bible. And do you know what? If you keep doing that, coming to church week by week, going to your kids' groups, reading the Bible at home, praying, seeking God, telling God, I really want to know you, God. If you do that, by the end of your life, or when you just get older, or really very soon, you might open the Bible at the book of Psalms, and you read it, and you suddenly realize it's not so gobbledygookish anymore. I get it, because I'm starting to piece it all together. God's Spirit is helping me understand the Bible, and I'm getting it, and I'm getting to know God better. And that is the meaning of life, to know God. So it's worth the effort, okay? Keep reading the Bible, keep praying, keep seeking to know God, and he will help you piece it together. And you know what? The final picture is so beautiful. The final picture of God is so satisfying to know God in all his beauty and all his greatness, all his power and all his love. It's the best thing ever. So keep reading your Bibles. Right, we're going to sing a song about some words of Jesus. And Jesus talks about building your life on him and on his word. And the song is, the wise man built his house upon the rock. Okay, there's some actions to this. I haven't sung this song for a very long time, so I'm going to need some people to help me. I don't know if the singers are going to help us. No, they're not. They're too embarrassed. It's the same in my church. The singers don't do the actions. For the, but I'll have a go, and we can all have a go together. All right? So let's stand and sing, The wise man built his house upon the rock.
you guys can go to your classes and you can go and build your lives on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll be praying for you in here as you do that. We're praying for ourselves as well as we do the same together. Have a great time. If people left here want to open their Bibles at Isaiah 53... Before we do that, let's pray together. Let's speak to the Lord together. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, what an amazing privilege it is. What an important part of our week to come into your presence, the presence of the living God, to come to you, the God who made all things and who says to us, I love you, you are my children. What a wonderful thing it is to know you, to know forgiveness of sins, to know the hope of eternal life, to go through this world, this life, knowing that you are with us and you will never forsake us nor abandon us. What a wonderful thing it is when the Holy Spirit gives a person's heart a true glimpse of Jesus Christ and who he really is. And we just bow our heads before you, Father, this morning, so full of thanks in our hearts that you have given us that vision of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you have shown us his glory and we've come to believe in him and experience all of these spiritual blessings. And Heavenly Father, now as the the children meet in their classes, thank you so much for their teachers who give up their time uh, to pass the gospel on to that, that generation. And we pray for your blessing up there today. We pray for your Holy Spirit to be moving and working in the children's hearts and lives, that they would build their lives upon Jesus Christ, that your spirit would give in their hearts a spark of of love for the Lord Jesus that will grow and and never go out. We pray and, and covet that for the children here in this church. We pray the same things for ourselves as we... Uh, approach your word now. Um, your prophet Isaiah wrote this, this chapter so many years ago, and he wrote it so beautifully, and it's full of so much truth, so many wonderful truths about you. And we ask, thank you for this time that we have together this morning to meditate upon, upon your word together, to ponder it in our minds. By your spirit, we pray it would go down deep into our hearts that we would know you, sink our roots even deeper into the Lord Jesus Christ and have our lives changed and transformed. We want to pray for Dave and Rebecca and Phoebe today. Ask that you'd refresh them physically and mentally and spiritually. We pray that they would know you with them today as they, they worship you today, your presence with them. Just ask for your blessing upon them. Uh, that Dave and Rebecca would come back strengthened and encouraged and refreshed, ready to keep leading and keep serving you here. We pray for the members of the church here as well, that they would make uh, their leaders, they wouldn't be a burden to their leaders, um, but they would make their leaders' ministry a real joy, and that together, one anothering, uh, encouraging one another in the gospel, building one another up in Christ, pointing each other to the Lord Jesus, growing together in grace, more complete in him, eyes fixed on him, the eyes of our hearts fixed on the Lord Jesus as we head towards that great and glorious and final day with anticipation and expectation uh, and being helped with all the struggles, all the difficulties, all the challenges of life in this fallen world, knowing your presence with us. So we commit all of these things to you in this time that we have together now. In the powerful and the very great name of Jesus. Amen. In chapters 42 to 53 of Isaiah, you find four very special songs. They're called the servant songs. Uh, they're songs written to honor 
a coming servant of the Lord, uh, a spirit-filled servant of the Lord, someone who will serve God and serve God's people and through his service deliver people from their sins. Today we're looking at the fourth of these songs together in chapter 53 and this song in particular describes the suffering of this coming servant, this astonishingly wonderful servant of the Lord. Who is this servant that Isaiah 53 speaks of? Well, like Cinderella's slipper, the prophecy of Isaiah 53, it only fits one person, and that person is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. There are seven direct quotations in the New Testament from Isaiah 53 and about 40 allusions to it in general saying this prophecy, this famous, very precious prophecy was fulfilled in the life and the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this chapter of the Bible was written 700 years before Christ was born and yet one commentator has written correctly, he said it's almost like Isaiah wrote these words at the foot of Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified. As I preach on this passage today, I'm very aware that I'm treading on sacred ground. Uh, some of you, th- th- this chapter is not just famous, it's incredibly precious to, to believers around the world. And some of you have loved and meditated on this passage probably for more years than I've been alive, some of you. Uh, We're walking on very sacred ground. There's so much depth, so much richness in these words. I simply want to draw your attention today to two truths, just two wonders uh, which the Lord has drawn my attention to as I've meditated on this chapter for the last couple of weeks. Firstly, I want you to notice from this chapter, this song is about God's surprising servant. He's a surprising servant. The poem begins in chapter 52, verse 13, with the words, Behold my servant. The words of God to you today as we open God's word. Behold my servant. This chapter is written by a heavenly master who is thoroughly pleased with his good and faithful servant that he composes this song to honor him and to draw the attention of your heart towards his servant this morning. And it starts by saying, God says the very first line of this song, my servant is worthy of the highest exaltation. My servant deserves greatness forever. And yet, and yet the first two stanzas of this song also describe how so many people in this world, they miss his glory. They do not see it. This astonishingly wonderful servant of the Lord is an enigma to people. They don't see what God sees in him. And so we read in verse 1, chapter 53, verse 1, who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? God's servant is the arm of the Lord. God's servant is, he has, he is the saving power of God to deliver his people from sin and death. And this song asks in the very beginning, who has had the saving power of God in Jesus Christ revealed to their hearts? Who has been given eyes to see who he is? Who has been given ears to to hear and believe the message about him? Who has come to experience this astonishingly wonderful servant's grace personally in their lives? And we're told some really surprising things about about this servant in these verses. In chapter 52, verse 14, we're told that God's servant was so disfigured and mutilated and marred that people barely recognized him as a human being. We're told in chapter 53, verse 2, that God's servant grew up like a shoot in dry ground. Just imagine that, a shoot growing up in dry, cracked ground. He grew up in Nazareth. It was the armpit of Galilee, basically. People scoffed, could anything good come out of Nazareth, that place? 
Jesus was born to a teenage girl who got pregnant before she was married. He was raised by a poor, obscure carpenter who seemed to die young. God's astonishingly wonderful servant was a shoot that grew up in dry ground. And then Isaiah writes in verse 2, God's servant, his wonderful servant, had no beauty or majesty to attract people to him. He was undesirable to so many people. No one in his hometown ever said about Jesus in his youth, wow, this kid is going places. No one said that about him. He was just so ordinary, so overlooked, that the first time he preached in his, the synagogue of his hometown, and he stood up and he took the scroll of Isaiah, and he said, this scroll is fulfilled in your presence today. I am the spirit-filled servant that Isaiah spoke of. Everyone said, isn't this Joseph's son? And when Jesus insisted that a prophet never has honor, is never received in his hometown, they were so offended, they took him out of the synagogue and they tried to throw him off a cliff. Verse 3 says, God's servant was despised and rejected. People looked at his suffering and his humiliation and his weakness, particularly at the cross, with absolute disgust and, and scorn. People were like Job's friends. They, they saw the suffering of this, of this man, this servant, and they concluded there's no way God could be with him. There's no way God could be on this man's side. God must have rejected him. God must have cursed him. God must be punishing him because he's such a, he must be such a wretched person in the eyes of God. That's what humans saw when they looked at the Lord Jesus. But chapter 52, verse 13 tells us that when God saw Jesus, when God sees Jesus, he sees a faithful servant. He sees someone wise, it says in that verse. Someone so incredibly wise, they are worthy of the greatest honor, the greatest exaltation. They're worthy to be raised and lifted up forever. That's what God sees when he looks at his servant. So why is God's view of this servant and humanity's view of this servant so different? There's a veil over our eyes. There's a veil over our hearts which prevents people from, from seeing the glory of Jesus. A blindness in our hearts to the ways of God and the, the work of God in our world. So how can a human being come to behold Jesus in the same way God the Father beholds Jesus? How can we see Jesus for who he, he really is? And the purpose of this song, the purpose of Isaiah 53, is to help people see Jesus for his true beauty, to see Jesus for who he really is by the power of the Holy Spirit. This song explains that today, in our hearts this morning, we need to understand why. Why God's faithful servant suffered. Why he suffered. Why he went through all of that. To understand this servant's true worth. And the central truth this poem communicates to me and you this morning is this. It says, this servant's terrible sufferings were for you. They were all for you and for me, for us. And it's only when you grasp in your heart that Christ's sufferings were for you, then you will see the true glory of Jesus Christ and just how astonishingly wonderful God's servant really is. Only when you can say with the Apostle Paul, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. When you can say that from your heart, the cross is changed from something horrible to something unspeakably precious. When I survey the wondrous cross, the cross become wondrous to your heart. If it's wonderful to your heart, it's because you're, you've grasped. All his suffering was for you in love. And so that's my, my second point this morning from this song. Behold the servant's suffering 
for you, for you. But what, what does it mean? What does it mean that Jesus Christ suffered for you and for me? Just want to draw two wonders out from the verses. What does it mean that his suffering was for us? Okay, two, two wonders from these verses. Number one, God's servant suffered to bear our sin and guilt away. God's servant suffered to bear my sin and my guilt away. Verse 5 says, he was, he was pierced for our transgressions. Transgressions means rule breaking. Transgressions means stepping where you shouldn't step in life. Going where you shouldn't go in life. He was pierced for all the times that we have done that in our lives. And then we read, he was crushed for our iniquities. Iniquities refers to the way uh, our hearts are warped and distorted by, by wrong desires and unclean, it refers to our unclean nature. So all our dirt and all the distortion and twistedness of our hearts came crushing down on God's servant on the cross at Calvary. In this chapter, Isaiah uses wave after wave of substitutionary language. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Verse 6 says, we all, every one of us in this room today, all of us, we go astray from God in our hearts. We leave his paths of righteousness. But, the verse says, the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus Christ, the punishment and the penalty we deserve for our sin it was laid on him. And by his wounds, we are healed today. John Stott famously wrote in his book, The Cross of Christ, he said, the concept of substitution may be said then to lie at the heart of both sin and salvation. For the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God, while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. Man asserts himself against God and puts himself where only God deserves to be. God sacrifices himself for man and puts himself where only man deserves to be. Man claims prerogatives which belong to God alone. God accepts penalties which belong to man alone. See the wonder of God's servant and what he's done for us? Verse 4 also says, and this is, this is really important, it says, he took up our pain. Jesus Christ took up our pain. Jesus was not a victim. He actively and willingly chose to do this for me and you in his great love for you. The servant and the master in heaven are one. Jesus taught that, didn't he? He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The will of the Father and the Son were aligned in the cross of Christ. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit had planned this in eternity past, before the creation of the world, to do this for us, to go through with this for us in love. And so the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. In his sufferings, in the sufferings of Christ, he obediently and purposefully fulfilled the scriptures, fulfilled God's plan, great plan of redemption for me and you, for humankind. This was his loving purpose for us. The end of verse 6 says, The Lord has laid on his faithful and righteous servant the iniquity of us all. It all went on the innocent one who had no violence, no deceit. I don't know about you, but one week of all my sin and all my junk, it feels pretty heavy. But all my sin, past, present, future, all of it, 
And not just my sin, but your sin too. All the sin of Upton Baptist Church and the lives that are represented here today, past, present, and future. And not just our sin, but the sin of all God's people throughout history, around the world, all of their sin, throughout all of their lives. The weight, the weight of all of that iniquity, it came funneling down on Jesus Christ one afternoon 2,000 years ago on a hill outside Jerusalem. No wonder Jesus was sweating drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane at the thought of what he was going to go through for us to bear our sin and our guilt away forever. And what was the result of this, this substitutionary sacrifice? Verse 10 and 11 tell us, God's servant gave his life as a sin offering to remove our guilt, to remove our sin, and to make all who believe in him righteous in the sight of God forever. He did it to justify you, to justify me. I I just want to be as clear as I can this morning about the gospel, what it means that Jesus suffered for us. You and I are sinners. Jesus Christ, he's not a sinner. And Jesus Christ is coming to you today by his spirit, through his word, to your heart, and he's offering you a deal. And he's saying to you this morning, would you like to trade places with me? You give me your sin, knowing in your heart that I bore it all for you on the cross and I paid the penalty for it in full, And I will give you in its place my spotless, good, righteous record. No more fear of hell. No need. No more fear of the punishment we deserve for our sin. Just peace with God forever. Eternal life. You can be blameless in the sight of God today. You can enjoy and know God's full acceptance, full approval, his his welcoming, his delighted welcome into his kingdom forever through trading places with Jesus Christ by faith. That's a good deal, isn't it? It's called justification by grace through faith. Have you personally received it? Have you received that? Have you personally, in your heart, trusted in Jesus to bear your sin and guilt away and to give you, in its place, his perfect, sinless record? If you've never done that before, can I urge you this morning to cross the line, to put your faith personally in Jesus Christ, to receive this through prayer and trust. Scriptures say Jesus Christ would would love to trade places with you. Be so delighted to do that for you. And the roadblock to accepting this offer is not your sin. God can deal with your sin in an instant, just like that, through the power of the cross. The roadblock to accepting this, this salvation is that little voice inside your heart which says, I'm a good person. I don't need this. I'm all right by myself. I don't need forgiveness. I don't need a savior to rescue me from a lost eternity. I'm doing fine by myself. I can live a perfectly good life, great life by myself. I don't need all of this. Don't listen to that voice in your heart. It's deceptive. Listen to God calling you this morning by his spirit through his word to come to him and to swap places with Jesus Christ. And if you are someone who has stepped over the line and has put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for your justification. Would you rest in it today? Would you rest your heart in God's work for you through his servant this morning, the substitutionary work of God's servant on your behalf? Would you enjoy it? You don't need to beat yourself up about all your insufficiencies anymore. Jesus suffered the blows in your place. You don't need to do that to yourself. You don't need to feel crushed by your failures and your guilt anymore. Jesus has been crushed in your place because he wants to liberate you from from shame. 
and from guilt? Will you stop worrying about a debt which has already been paid for in full on your behalf, willingly, gladly? Will you keep confessing your sins to Jesus each day in faith, letting him bear away your sin and your guilt forever? His suffering was for you. It was to bear your sin and guilt away. And finally, and much more briefly, can I just draw your attention to one final wonder in this passage in verse 3. Last point. God's servant also suffered to bear our sorrows and griefs. God's servant also suffered to bear our sorrows and our griefs. Verse 3 describes God's servant as a man of sorrows or pain. Someone who was acquainted with grief or suffering. The righteous one who, who is now risen and exalted and is at the right hand of the Father in heaven this morning, he knows sorrow and grief and pain and suffering from the inside. I mean, he really gets it. He really understands it. When you share your painful burdens with Jesus Christ in prayer, he never says to you, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't understand what you're talking about. Can you explain it a bit more to me? He gets it perfectly. He understands it from the inside. He feels your pain in heaven, in his heart. He understands. He's compassionate towards you. Verse 4 is a staggering verse. It goes on to say, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Uh, In the ESV, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. So he didn't only bear our sin and guilt, he also bore our sorrows and our griefs, our sickness and our pains on the cross. What does that mean? What does that mean? There are many prosperity gospel teachers on YouTube and faith healers on YouTube who will take this verse and they will say, if you are ill or you are in pain, it's not because Jesus doesn't want you well, he died for your sickness and your physical healing. The reason you're experiencing that physical unwellness is because you're not trusting him enough for it. I hope you're discerning about that kind of false teaching that's all over YouTube. I hope it appalls you. That's not what this verse means. What does it mean that Christ bore our sorrows and our griefs? It means this. It means when Jesus Christ died on the cross, He bore our sin and guilt, and when he did that, he dealt with the root cause of all our sadness and sickness and pain and death. All of of those things entered into creation as a result of the fall, as a consequence of sin. The cross and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they bring spiritual healing, forgiveness of sin, eternal life. But they will also, one day, on the last day, they will bring full restoration to the entire cosmos. No more sickness, no more sadness, no more crying, no more death forever on the last day. By bearing our sin and guilt, he has also borne our sorrows and griefs because one day, because of the cross, Jesus Christ will wipe away all the tears of this life forever and you will experience perfect health in a new creation as a result of the cross. But until that final day comes, we pray for physical healing, we pray for recovery, knowing God is able, knowing God is compassionate, but also knowing we can't demand or insist that God grant it to us in this present life. Any physical healing or quick recovery or earthly blessing we experience in this present age as a result of our prayers is a wonderful blessing from God. And we give thanks to him and we rejoice in it and we're encouraged. But we also know physical health and physical blessings in this world are temporary. We live in a fallen age that is in bondage to decay. And any physical healings or physical recovery we experience as the work of God in our lives are the first fruits of what God is ultimately going to do at the end of the age 
when Christ comes and when he returns and when he rids creation of all sickness, all disease, all suffering, and all death for the sake of his church, for the sake of me and you forever. We look forward to that day. And verse 11 speaks of that final day when the servant of the Lord will be satisfied at the result of all his sufferings. And that final day, the servant of the Lord will say, all that terrible suffering was worth it. Why? Because he will see his people, me and you, forgiven, made righteous, brought into the presence of God, living in a new creation, set free from guilt, set free from grief, set free from sickness and death and pain, and it will make Christ's heart so happy, so happy. For the the joy of seeing us healed from sin and sorrow, guilt and grief, Christ endured the cross. Verse 12 says, Because the servant of the Lord poured out his life unto death, the eternal joy of full restoration is coming. It's coming. Relief is coming. And until that day, I just want to finish with this, until that day, when our faith turns to sight, I want you to remember this. As you live in the world this week, in exile, this fallen world this week, do you ever feel ugly and undesirable? Do you ever feel boring and unnoticed? Have you ever experienced rejection? Have you ever felt despised by people? Do you ever feel like people must look at the mess of your life and think, man, what a failure. God cannot be with that person. He's not exactly a a strong example of a Christian blessed by God, that person. There must be something wrong with their faith for them to be in that kind of mess. Do you ever feel like people think that about your life? Or maybe you're acquainted with sorrow and grief, sickness and pain. Have you ever suffered unjustly? Have you ever been through anguish of soul? Have you ever been stretched by life just so far you've actually felt a bit scared that something's going to snap inside? Have you ever been there? God says to you this morning, behold my servant. Fix the eyes of your heart upon my servant. He's a fellow sufferer. He's walked your path before you. He will walk your path with you today. And so this week, in response to God's word, keep confessing your sins to Jesus. Let him liberate you from guilt by bearing it all away. But also keep sharing your sorrows and your griefs with Jesus. Let him bear that grief, those griefs that feel so crushing. Let him shoulder them for you and with you. Francis Bacon once said, if you want to double your joys or cut your sorrows in half, share them with a friend. What a friend God has given us in his servant, Jesus Christ. Do you share your sorrows with him in prayer, honestly? Do you talk to him about your heartaches? Do you cast them on him? Have you been doing that in your life the last few weeks? Things that are hard? Sharing your joys with him in prayer increases them. Sharing your heartache with him, the one who understands, reduces the burden. Relief and full restoration is coming, but until that that final day... You walk with Jesus Christ by faith and he will bear your heavy load with you and he will walk your difficult path with you. Keep close to him in fellowship. Keep your eyes fixed on him by faith as you walk through this life. Let's respond together by singing. I'm going to sing our final song and then I'm going to, we'll remain standing and I'll close in prayer. But a right response to this wonderful chapter of the Bible, Isaiah 53, is worship. Ready to sing from your heart, to thank him and to praise him from your heart. Christ, our hope in life and death.
Let's give him our thanks and praise and sing for his glory now. stand. Father, thank you for calling us to behold something of the glory of your servant this morning. Uh, Thank you for opening our hearts to see more of his power and his love and his worth. Thank you that all his very great sufferings were for us, to bear our sin and to bear our guilt away, to bear our sorrows and to bear our griefs. Thank you for a wonderful saviour Thank you that he went through with the cross for the joy and the delight of seeing ordinary sinful people like us liberated from from sin and sorrow forever. Please forgive us for our many sins. Give us an assurance of our righteousness in Christ before you and help us day by day to enjoy your full approval of us in your son. Help us to share our heartaches with you the one who understands us. 
Help us to find relief and comfort in your love and your care. Thank you that one day all our tears from this life will be wiped away forever. And we will experience the restoration of all things, spiritual and physical. And until that day, we ask that you would help us to walk by faith in close fellowship with you. Praise be to Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.